I warned you not to listen to that, Gets My Goat. Now look at you. Nah. Hey everybody, this is Big Anklevich, and we are here with another That Gets My Goat. Here, not at my side, is... Rish Outfield, Rish Outfield. <laughs> wow, that sounds far. So, this is kind of odd. We've, we've never done a podcast long distance like this before. Nope, never. We've never had to. Does it seem weird to you? Yeah. I, except for this is how I do it with Marshall all the time. It seems weird to me because our connection is not very good right now. <laughs> oh, really? So I'm not hearing what you're saying. Any of it? I'm not sure what you said or what you didn't say because I'd hear a little bit and then it would cut out. Mm. Have you been saying very short things? Yes. Oh, okay. Maybe I am hearing it then. You're just effing with me, aren't you? You're just going, ha! People always do that in movies. They say, oh, hey, I'm going through a ton. I can't. I... What? Say. Good. Well, it works because I feel like I'm just, I don't. Ah. Ah? No, I can't. No one can't even speak. You never could. <laughs> All right. So anyways, we're here with the That Gets My Goat. And we're here to talk about a movie. Surprisingly enough, it's also the first time that we went separately to see a movie. But just after I moved here to Houston, Spider-Man Homecoming came out. Um, it actually came out basically the week that I moved into my house, which made it really difficult for me to get out to see it, because there was a lot of work to be done at home. And so, God, I think, what, did you see it like opening night or whatever? I did, yes. Um, so how many times have you seen it since then? None. Just the one none. time. I, I, I meant to see it again, so I'd be prepared for this, and uh, just, it's hard to. All right. So no, I haven't. Well, it's going to be much fresher in your mind than it is with mine. So that'll be interesting to see what you remember. Yeah, I, I, I guess I did see it last night. <gasps> I, I went out and saw the very last showing last night by myself because I have no friends anymore that can go with me. Although I guess I could have dragged my son to it. He was mad that I was going to see it without him. But my wife was asleep, and the little guy was asleep, and I wanted him to be home in case the little guy got up so that he wouldn't bug my wife. So he got screwed by being a, if there's an issue, you have to babysit guy. But um, I really enjoyed Spider-Man Homecoming. I assume you probably did too, because you are a Spider-Man guy. I am. I, I love Spider-Man, and uh, except for Amazing Spider-Man 2, I, you know, have enjoyed all of the releases. But what, the, uh, I don't know, I, it's, it's, it's been long enough that I, there has been fallout, there have been naysayers, there have been people saying that the film is a, what's the opposite of, su of a success? An unsuccess, yes. I think, is the dictionary def the word. There have been people delighting in the unsuccess of Spider-Man Homecoming. And, and and so part of that made me wonder if, you know, oh, shoot, if I, if I saw it again, would I not like it? But there was definitely a moment during my viewing when I was filled with this happiness. And I thought, you know, this is the best Spider-Man has ever been. And I just, I felt so happy that finally, finally they got it, you know? Huh. I'm interested to see what that moment was. First, I'll tell you the moment that made me, like, laugh out loud and even have tears come to my eyes uh, for a moment. Which, again, I, I think I've said this before on other shows, it's not really that hard to cause tears to come from my eyes. I am a crybaby, I admit it. But right off the top of the show, the Marvel logo starts playing and this big orchestral song starts going. And after a moment, I realized it's the Spider-Man cartoon theme song being played by the orchestra 
and the biggest, most, you know, bombastic John Williams tradition. As they're like, da na na, da na, and I just like, oh my gosh, that is so great. And just having that off the top of the show, I don't know, it's like adding a, a rocket booster <laughs> to the back of me, you know, as far as my speed is going to go. I'm gonna love it. I'm already out of the gate going twice as fast as I would have otherwise. So it was a good beginning. Now, do if we talk about your moment, will we be way too far ahead, or or is it okay to do that now? Oh, I I don't know what that moment was, man. It's been too long. Oh, <laughs> I just about halfway through the movie, I thought, oh, holy cow, this is my favorite Spider-Man. I mean, part of it is just the the kid. Right. Tom Holland was so believable as a kid. Yeah, and. That I don't know how old the guy is, 21, something like that. But I believed he was actually 15. There were moments when he's just like the shape of his face and his reactions and the way he talks. I was like, this is a kid, Spider-Man, you know, not a 30-year-old guy playing a kid. And I just, and that that really went far to me loving this, the character and... Mm-hmm. I don't know. He, th- there was, this was a different Spider-Man than we had seen, and I mean it's obviously the same Spider-Man from Civil War, but where he's just so bright-eyed and naive and awkwardly decent and all that, and I just, you know, there are a dozen different ways you can interpret Spider-Man, and and they're all accurate because there have been so many different iterations of the character over the years but just the inherent decency and kidness of this guy right it was it's something that we hadn't seen before you know the the andrew garfield and the toby Maguire didn't choose to go that way yeah yeah i really enjoyed the the character that he was and yeah he was totally believable as a 15 year old i i hope that that will hold true as time goes by, because obviously they're planning on, you know, sticking with this for several. I mean, they they've already shot Avengers: Infinity War Part One or something like that, and they sent out they tweeted out pictures of Tom Holland with Robert Downey Jr. and Chris Pratt on the first day of shooting, so we know that he's in it. And Spider-Man will return, as the credits said. You know, how, how long they'll be able to pull that off if he's 15 now and they get another movie out. Uh, you know, how long will they keep him that young? When will they say, okay, now he's going to college? Like they did with Spider-Man in Spider-Man 2. Was it just called Spider-Man 2? It was. It was, huh? The one with Tobey Maguire where he's already in college by movie two yeah i don't know i would like that's one of the things that i always liked about spider-man is that he was just a kid uh when he was just a kid i mean obviously there has he has grown over the (laughs) what 60 some odd years how long has he existed Uh, i would say 54 years now so yeah he's obviously uh he's grown a little bit they i mean he's become an adult he's gotten married he's had a child right uh or, they did away with the child so yes and no they retcon the child away with the deal with the devil well long before that but yeah oh yeah wasn't he a, a school teacher wasn't that what his job was uh last time we were reading the comics yeah he well after the school teacher he was the head of his own company like Stark Industries. It was like a Parker Technologies kind of thing. They've just done all sorts of different stuff with the character, but I I felt like some of this was based on the Ultimate Spider-Man, and in Ultimate Spider-Man, he was always a teenager. Uh So this movie, you think, was based somewhat on Ultimate (sighs) Spider-Man? Well, some of what I've heard definitely is. Like, uh, you know, a Hispanic scorpion with a ton of, of prison tattoos... That's what Ultimate Scorpion is like, and and uh, Donald Glover. So that's who that dude was at the end. Sorry to interrupt you. 
That guy was Scorpion? Yeah, well, it was Matt Gargan. He hasn't become Scorpion yet, but... Did we see him earlier in the show? He was the guy that was buying the uh, the Vulture's, you know, stolen tech. Uh, on the, uh, the ferry that got torn in half. Uh-huh. That was where we saw him before. Okay, yeah, when he came up in that post-credits or mid-credits prison sequence, I was just like... Are we supposed to know him? Yeah, I was like, I, I, I feel like I should know him. And the way he looks makes me think Scorpion. But I don't remember seeing him before. That kind of stuff always bugs me. I hate it when I, when I feel, find myself that way, feeling that way in, in that position. Well, it, I mean, there are a zillion different characters, and you can't know if somebody is supposed to be somebody. I remember when the X-Men came out in 2000, and there were people that were saying, oh, and this guy has to be this kid, and this kid has to be this character. And it's like, well, maybe they're just students. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, maybe they're not coming back in the next show. There, yeah, there were <laughs> definitely some characters. Like the the fat guy that was Michael Keaton's tech dude. Uh-huh. Uh, he was supposed to be the tinkerer. I discovered that later. He was a, you know, a minor spider villain and then yeah we had two different shockers Mm -hmm. one of them actually sort of wore a jacket with the shocker yeah i noticed uh, that design on he was the one that died horribly he did die horribly yeah Uh, and then yeah donald glover played a character who in the ultimate comics is the uncle of miles morales and who becomes uh the prowler so Oh. I was just like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. But because I don't read the Ultimate Comics, I had to have the internet tell me that. Yeah, internet is nice for those kind of things. Okay. I, I, I feel we're already dealing with minutia here. Um, I mean, the stuff <laughs> that we, we ought to talk about are the Vulture, about Michael Keaton as the Vulture. What did you think of about that? How, how was it to have Michael Keaton as the villain? <laughs> I think that he should. There should have been some scene where he grabbed somebody and told them to tell his tell their friends about him. What are you? I'm the vulture. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, Michael Keaton's old now, which is, I guess that's just always going to be weird. I don't know. Every time another star is old, and I realize that therefore so am I. I liked him. I thought his whole thing was believable. I wondered how you felt about it because they took the Vulture, who I guess was kind of a high-tech dude all along. But he had, you know, an outfit, he had a deal, and this Vulture was super high-tech. It's like they had to make it, okay, this is totally realistic. What this guy flies with is, you know, a full-on jetpack thing. Instead of the Vulture just had, like, these wings... That flew, what did they fly, like electromagnetism or so? I can't remember what it was in the comic book, but, you know, Spider-Man knew that he, oh, he flies and he's silent when he flies, so that means it's this. <laughs> and I can... Uh, my friend from Germany uh, emailed me and he's like, oh, you're not going to like the Vulture, because they basically turned him into the Green Goblin. And uh, yeah, it is Adrian Toomes in name only, but the Vulture in the comics never really made any sense that he was like an 80 year old with no superpowers that somehow could go head to head with Spider-Man. So I felt like they improved on the vulture in this. It didn't bother me at all what they did with him. Um, Did you want his costume to be more like the classic green with the feathery chest thing and the bald head? Or did you, were you satisfied with like the bomber jacket and helmet (laughs) thing that he had going on? Yeah, they paid lip service with it, with like the fur on the jacket. Uh Uh, So, you know, it's kind of similar, but... Right, like the shocker guy with his little yellow stripy jacket thing. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know, it would take a filmmaker beyond the talents of Joss Whedon to pull off the comic book vulture look and have it not just be absolutely ridiculous. Even if they cast John Malkovich 
or Ben Kingsley, you know, with a bald head and a big old nose. It just, I think it would look ridiculous. And, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, it doesn't bother me that they changed it. I mean, they, it's, it's totally a different character, but that character worked. And there's that moment at the middle of the film where Toombs answers the door. And boy, you <laughs> yeah. could have heard a pin drop in the audience. I mean, just, there was like a palpable tension, that, a wave that went over the audience of, oh, kind of thing. And they, I, it took me so much by surprise. I did not see that coming at all. And yeah, I have talked either. to other people who are like, oh, yeah, I went, the second he mentioned he had a family, and I'm like, really? That gave away that he was going to be the love interest's dad? Okay, but it worked so great. And then you have Peter trying to be normal, trying to behave in this scenario. <laughs> I mean, it was just, just a wonderful scene. Yeah, where the, it was amazing. The mom is like, oh, let's take a picture. And he's like, ah, ah, ah. And that, it just, oh, gosh, it reminded me of one of my favorite stories back when Stan and John Romita were doing the book where... Norman Osborne's memory came back and he realized who he was and realized who Peter Parker was, but he kept it a secret. And at one point he sort of tips his hat when everybody's together. Peter's got all of his friends together and Norman's got his friends together, like Gwen's dad and J. Jonah Jameson and Robbie Robinson. And Peter realizes, holy, holy crap, this guy knows who I am. How do I pretend that everything is okay when this guy could snap and kill all these people that I love in a second? It was just this wonderful moment in the comics, and I felt like that was echoed in that scene where it's like I'm still expected to go to the prom and behave like a normal teenager when uh, when this guy <laughs> standing before me as a supervillain uh, it was really, really cool. And yeah, then you get the scene in the car where, you know, the dad talk scene. And it, it's funny because I've seen so many movies with Michael Keaton over the years from Night Shift on, and there's never been a movie where I rooted for somebody against Michael Keaton except for this movie. I mean, it's just like, sorry, <laughs> he's a bad guy. And yeah, he may have mixed motivations or whatever, but I so wanted Peter to take this guy down. Yeah, I was going to say that that was that scene's got to be the best part of the whole film when he opens the door. Your stomach just drops and the whole time you're you know, you're on the edge of your seat. You paid for the whole thing, but you only need the end. <laughs> Gosh, that's got to be the best scene in a film that I've seen for a long time. Just the surprise to it and then the tension the whole way through is so so strong. That is just super well done. Like, I, you know, it blows me away how well that part came across. And the, sadly, I mean, that's near the end. But, um, I mean, yeah, that's like the peak of the film. Uh, not the end of the film, which, you know, you're supposed to kind of build, 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 get to the end. Although, with superhero movies, that can always be a little hard because, you know, you get to that superhero comic book violence kind of stuff where it's hard to get too worried about somebody while they're fighting a, a monster or something because you know that they're going to be fine and they have super powers and super strength and super invulnerability etc but uh, a scene like that where you know the I don't know what the, the plot twists on you like that it, it was so good that it just blew me away it was really good well i felt like there were several scenes that were really really good in this movie I, just the scene where poor peter is stuck in that warehouse uh, uh trying talking to his suit and trying all this stuff and then the suit reveals that it's been 37 minutes <laughs> I just, oh, that was just a great, great scene. And, and and one of the criticisms that I've heard from fanboys, um, who, which I guess I'm not, uh, is that, oh, it was just so small stakes, so small scale. You had the big action sequence on the ferry 
And then everything else is so small. And dude, that's one of the reasons this movie worked. Uh-oh. Is that the whole city wasn't about to explode or a million people's lives weren't hanging in the balance. You know, there were like five people in the elevator that he saved. And that is a bigger deal than 5,000 people. Yeah, this movie, the stakes were so much better than the last one where, oh, there are two planes that are going to crash into each other. If we don't get the power back on in time. Oh yeah, that's a random stupid thing that somebody inserted into the script to make the stakes greater. Way to go, guys. You know, this one, the people and the the situations matter so much more when, yeah, he's the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, not the Avenger. I found it to be a lot better. I think that they need to pull the stakes back more often on these movies because they get to where, you know, I think we've talked about it before, you know, you have to up the stakes. Every time you have a sequel, you got to up the stakes. And, you know, now not the whole world is going to die. The whole universe is going to die. Oh, now it's not the universe. It's the multiverse. It stops mattering. You know what I mean? It's, It's more important when you have the one person that you've developed into somebody that you care about in Jeopardy than it is when there's a a very large number. It frustrates me a little the way that they assume that they have to hold to that formula, and I'm glad that this one didn't. Exactly, and you and I talk about this all the time, is they feel like they have to spend so much money and go so big at the climaxes of of these movies that they lose me. 80% 80% of the time. Uh, how many times have you and I gone to see a movie and I said, you know, if the budget were smaller, that would have been a better movie. Right. And they actually took a step back budget-wise from Amazing Spider-Man 2. Uh, you would never know it seeing this movie because it didn't feel cheap in any way. Mm-hmm. But it, by making the stakes more personal and making the character somebody that cares about you know, a stranger rather than a thousand strangers, you can still have the tension. You can still have drama without having to spend a hundred million dollars in special effects. Okay. Here's another question for you. Okay. Cause I know that you're a huge Spider-Man fan. You're also a bit of a Spider-Man purist as a, uh... You know, you're not a fan of the Ultimate Universe, which I guess makes you just a Marvel purist as far as that goes. But Spider-Man is particularly, I wonder uh, how you feel about Spider-Man's suit and his suit having an internal voice that talks to him, etc. Did that, and that, you know, the eyes, (laughs) I remember we saw them in uh, Captain America and I didn't realize... You didn't notice in that movie that they were electronic. You know, oh, really? They were moving like that because it was part of some suit. It seemed like, whoa, they went all out. They're making the Spider-Man suit like actually have expressions to man. Wow, that really is like the comic book. Maybe everybody else realized that. I didn't notice that. Now you, it's, it's spelled out to you. Um, and yeah, there's all those other things. What did you think of that? Did you, did Peter Parker invent his web shooter, you think? Or was that a Tony Stark thing? Obviously, it was improved upon by Tony Stark at the very least. You ought to watch Civil War again. Because they have a conversation where Tony asks him where that stuff came from. The stuff, you know, that he swings on. And, uh-huh. and Peter says, I, I made it. And... Then, yeah, also you do see the eyes go... And there's a little noise when the eyes open and close in Civil War to let you know that it's a mechanical suit of some sort. Um, But because all of that was introduced last year, I had no problem accepting it in this movie. You know what I mean? Uh Uh-huh. At the end... At the new Avengers complex, when they they present an even more high-tech Spider-Man suit, I was just like, oh, no. I, you know, it was hard enough to get yeah. used to this suit. <laughs> and I was just happy that he didn't put it on 
And then he's back in, you know, Spider-Man 2.0, at least, rather than 3.0. I did shudder when I saw that suit. It was really ugly. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's probably the closest we'll get to the Iron Spider suit from the comics. The, the, The thing is, you're right. I am a purist, and I am really loyal to the stuff that happened in the comics, you know, especially the Stan Lee... Ditko and John Romita stuff and the stuff from my childhood. So I would not have been the best person to write this movie because I would be slavish to what had come before. And this movie honestly tossed so much of that out where like there's almost no recognizable supporting character in the movie. You know, nobody that we know from the comics. Yeah, the only one you you ever get that really stands out is Betty Brant. And she's <laughs> and nothing. Even she is, what is she? Yeah, I, she could have been anybody. There was this thing that I really, this, was, this is me being the purist. Flash Thompson sucked. He <laughs> sucked. Sucked in, in, in that you didn't like the take on the character or he was just a giant douche? Uh, well, he, he's supposed to be a giant douche. I mean, that's Flash Thompson's character. But Flash Thompson's character is also supposed to be the dashing, uh, really handsome, muscular, tall football player, basketball player, baseball. You know, I'm sure he's the three sport athlete, etc. The athlete, not the guy on the fucking academic decathlon team. And the, the, this dude was kind of dumpy and chubby and, you know, he had like a little double chin action going <laughs> and like a hook beak nose going. He's just n- not attractive, uh, you know, not the kind of guy that people would be mooning over, which is totally what Flash Thompson is supposed to be. He's supposed to be the guy that everyone wants to be and Peter Parker would love to be Flash. But instead, he's, you know, the object of Flash's uh, endless pestering. I don't know. The guy that they got was just none of those things. And maybe they didn't want him to be those things. I don't know. But he didn't work as Flash Thompson to me. Well, see, I felt like they purposely tried to, to avoid doing anything that had been done in the Sam Raimi or in the Mark Webb movies. Any character, any bit of the origin or any plot twist, any of that stuff, they're just like, no, we want this to be our own thing. Uh, You know, to the exclusion of Uncle Ben in this movie. And that's maybe the one thing that I didn't like about Spider-Man Homecoming is, I, you know, I, I really would have liked a little bit more explanation about the origin and at least bring up what Uncle Ben taught him and what Uncle Ben represented. Yeah, at least, at least a throwaway line. But they didn't. They went in a different direction and it felt totally different than the others. You know, they. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, they were trying to do a uh, John Hughes movie in the Marvel Universe. And uh, there were parts where it really felt like that. I mean, we'd, we've never seen Flash Thompson done the way that he's done in the comics in these movies. And, and that's a shame. But, yeah, they're, they're not going to do it with this guy. Yeah, this guy was kind of a goon. Yeah, he he just sucked. <laughs> I don't know. He's, that's me being the purist, I guess. But Flash Thompson's supposed to be a certain thing. And this guy just wasn't that. Well, I, I, along those same lines, uh, a lot was made of the, you know, uh, the pop singer Zendaya being in this movie. And I was so unfamiliar with that woman that I thought she was the hot chick that Peter was into that he ended up taking to the prom. And it wasn't until the end credits that I was like, oh, she was the geeky girl. Oh, oh, OK. I, ah, whoops. Maybe I need to watch it again. <laughs> Zendaya, uh, that, that's interesting. A lot of people made stuff out of that. I actually know who, now that you mention it, I know who she is. I 
my kids sometimes watched the show that she was on. She was on a a show about dancing. I can't remember what it was called, but there was a show on Disney Channel she was on. Is she something still then? Does she like have albums like Ariana Grande or something? Well, my guess is she wishes she were <laughs> Ariana Grande, but the yeah, she still has a career uh, as do most of those ex Disney stars, ex Nickelodeon stars or whatever. I just I didn't know who she was. It wasn't part of my uh background. Yeah, but it's, I, it's funny cuz I saw her the whole time and I even saw her name in the credits and it only now uh registers to me who she was. <laughs> God, what were the show? I think the show may have been called like Shake It Up or... That sounds right. Something like that. But anyhow, I don't know. Is she supposed to be a love interest for Peter? I mean, there, there's this horrifying line at the very end of the movie where she says, don't call me Michelle, call me MJ. And I was just like, oh, wait, really? Um, but MJ... Mich- uh... Mary Jane is not named Michelle. No. <laughs> Did you see for the NBA finals, there was a short film that they made. I don't know if I sent you the link to it, but it was delightful. I did not see it. No. Okay. Peter goes to this party that Tony Stark is throwing to watch the NBA finals. He walks in and he goes, MJ, you're here. And Magic Johnson turns around and goes, oh, call me Magic. <laughs> and... I thought that that joke worked really, really well, but I, I, I don't know what's going on in this. I, I have a great deal of love for almost all of Peter's supporting cast, his family of characters, you know, uh-huh. including Flash Thompson, who becomes a very interesting character over the years. But I guess the his buddy Ned is is a likable dorky kid. Uh-huh. I thought that that was cool and all that stuff. I just, I thought it would have been neat to recognize somebody. Right. I thought that there would be a lot more of that when Betty Brandt was the reporter on the little show. Because, I mean, that's the first thing you get as he comes into school right off the top. And then that's it. Which uh, seems like a bummer. But, you know, whatever, I guess. Uh <laughs> What did you think of all the cameos that we got in this? This was almost like a little uh, uh, Civil War. We had so many people show up in there. Including the one person that didn't even show up in Civil War or Avengers 2. Pepper Potts showed up. Well, hey, I was thrilled to see Pepper Potts again. Because I felt like they had sort of written her out of the series. Yeah. In the last two movies, especially with Tony saying, uh, we're on a break, you know, she's upset with me. I told, I made her certain promises and then I went back on them and I was just like, oh, well, we're not going to see her again. Uh Uh, But then they actually continued the storyline. They progressed those, their relationship in this movie, which I'm, I'm, I'm delighted by. I think that's great. And, and it was so neat to see Happy Hogan Right. All through this movie, he was sort of our Tony Stark surrogate, like a cheap version of Robert Downey Jr. that could do the <laughs> same things that Robert Downey Jr. would do, but just with a much smaller price tag. And he was so, so fat, too. Wasn't that just great? <laughs> Sorry. That was so great. <laughs> well, I just, I loved how mean he was to Peter there. They decided to dump on Peter Parker almost entirely throughout this movie, but in a sort of an affectionate, lovable loser sort of way, which I felt like totally worked because it's just, yeah, that gawky kid brother kind of character. There's a scene early, early on where he's calling happy Hogan and reporting on his day. And he says he helped some woman, find directions or whatever and and he's eating a sandwich and the kid is so earnest and he just can't get a break and that is the Peter Parker that we know and love and I I look so much forward to seeing them continue to use him in this way because there are a ton of characters that are hyper confident and smart alecky and you know they always have the funny 
one liner uh, and they think they're above everything. You know, we got a Tony Stark and we got an Ant Man and we've got a Doctor Strange and they're all that guy. And Chris Pratt is that guy in the, these movies. And but we don't have somebody who's just the hey, I'm so excited to be here. Please like me, which is what Peter Parker does in these movies. So I can't wait to see him in Avengers next year. And then he's got another solo Spider-Man movie the next year after that. Yeah, it'll be pretty cool to have him along. Now, you texted me the other day just before I went to the show. Uh Uh-oh. And you said, the theme for the new Spider-Man, I... Well, how did it go? I can't remember how it went. But anyways, you said... My cousin and I were humming it after yeah. we left the theater. Be- because you and I, we talked about that, or maybe I talked about it and you denied it so wrongly. <laughs> but it's like back when we were kids, these themes that John Williams would come up with were so great and so catchy that you would know them. Before seeing it on home video, before buying the soundtrack, you would know these themes. And it was just amazing that that happened in, for me and my cousin in a Spider-Man movie. And anyhow, Michael Giacchino, this generation's John Williams. Yeah, I found that interesting. And when I went into the show with that on my mind, I was watching for it. And I, I hadn't heard the theme for it before, so I had no idea what it was going to be. And then, of course, they opened the movie with the original cartoon theme. Did you think that's what it was uh, going to be? And I thought, oh, well, no wonder you were humming the theme when you uh, got out of the film. It's one that you've known your whole life. But then, of course, that didn't come up again. But uh, I think the real key was that you sat through the credits. And, you know, they, they played the theme lots of times in the film, so there was that. But also in the credits, uh, Michael is a Giacchino? Is that how you say it? That's how I said it. How do you say it? I have no idea. I've always said Giacchino, but I'm sure that's wrong. I swear he did, like, theme and variations on the Spider-Man theme in the credits, the closing credits. (laughs) It kept going from one version of that song to the next, to the next, to the next, to the point where they had, like, the the drum kit start in. (laughs) And then <laughs> they played the song that way. So sitting to the end of the credits, and it's funny because I didn't realize that it had happened to me until I was halfway driving home and I was still singing the song, humming the song in my head as I drove. And I went, oh, wow, yeah, did it to me too. Oh, um, good. But it was good. I really enjoyed the music from that show and I'd like to get the soundtrack to it. Well, and one more thing that you should have loved is they played the Avengers theme when we saw that new Avengers building, the 2012 theme. Right. And it's just like, oh, yeah. Oh, the, uh, yeah, they had a theme. Maybe they finally listened to our show and heard us complain <laughs> about it enough that uh, they've learned some lessons and they're going to start doing that. I did notice in the list of songs at the end of the sh- uh, in the credits, they had Avengers theme from uh, Alan Silvestri. Well, every single credit should look like that. But, well, obviously they don't feel like I feel on that. Another thing that I loved about the movie was just how funny it was. They they chose not to have the dour, unhappy, always in the shadow of death and failure Peter Parker. And yeah, that's, that's one interpretation of the character and... and The one that comes alive when he's fighting crime and has a blast doing it and can't wait to be Spider-Man again is a totally valid interpretation of the character. And and I think it will make for repeat viewing more so than some of these other, even when I try to do right, everything goes wrong kind of movies. Yeah, and he he still had that stuff going on too, though, you know, every time he tried to do right, tried to stop the thing going on on the ferry it didn't go well you know that kind of stuff still happened but uh, you know in this case it was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed peter facing it and so it didn't always seem like i'm so sad i'm toby mcguire <laughs> well and and 
yeah, that is a valid interpretation of the character, too. I still love the second Spider-Man movie. It's still great. But yeah, they have very different feels and very different um, intentions going into it. And and there's still room for darkness. There's still room for tragedy. And and it's... uh, One one more thing I was going to mention. I don't know if we did mention it, but... uh, Tony Stark being in this movie, that was all over the trailers. You know, it should have come as no surprise that he was in this. But just him being like a father figure to the kid was so cool and so refreshing. And uh, just yeah, a different side to Tony than we had seen previous. Uh, and it also just it stresses the difference between these two characters of the Peter who can't catch a break and he can't, he doesn't have two dimes to rub together. And then Tony, who has this drone suit that comes to talk to Peter while he's out having drinks on the other side of the world. Right. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard because Tony Stark is able to just do anything. I did like the part where, uh, he was mad at him. He's like, if you would just listen to me, if you cared enough, you would show up. And then chink comes out of the the suit, and he's wearing a suit. And like, <laughs> for some reason, it seems like he shouldn't be wearing a freaking three piece suit underneath the Iron Man armor. But yeah, I guess you get what you get. <laughs> well, he rushed away from whatever he was doing. Right. It was actually important enough for him to be there in person, and that stuff is. We saw that a little bit in the comics when you and I were reading it around the Civil War era. You know, Peter just, he didn't have a dad. And Tony Stark seems like the perfect dad. You know, everything is glamorous and everything is exciting. And so, yeah, he sort of glommed on to him as, you know, oh gosh, I want to do everything that this guy does. Uh, but he can't be Tony Stark. If If he tried, he would make such a disaster of it but th- these are things that when you're young you have to learn by doing anyway the the fact that they've got him so young means that we can have a lot more learning experiences and arcs with this character before it becomes yes a 30 year old guy playing right a teenager yeah i look forward to seeing what else we get out of this I really like this incarnation of Spider-Man. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just hope it uh, it works out. It keeps going as good as it did. I was getting a little bit worried as I went to go see the movie because it took me so long to get out to see it. I'd seen several people post on Facebook. And so many of them were gushing posts of, Oh, I think this may be my favorite Spider-Man ever. And, oh, the Spider-Man was so good, and et cetera. Oh, that can't help you, huh? What's that? So that can't help you when you right. do stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I, uh, I was worried that my expectations might be too high. Yeah, I, I, it came out okay in the end, so <laughs> that's fine. But, yeah, I, I saw somebody post the other day about how they finally were able to get out and see... Wonder Woman and the theater was empty. I don't I couldn't understand if they were complaining that this movie wasn't getting any love. But it's just like of course it was empty. And yeah, you know, movies don't have that kind of a shelf life anymore. People don't they don't play forever and you don't go to see it eventually. You see it soon and yeah, if you don't it gets ruined for you, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, it's weird to me to have waited as long as I did for something like this. You know, lots of movies doesn't matter, you know. It doesn't matter that I didn't see The Mummy when it came out. Because I probably won't see it at all. And if it gets spoiled, who cares? Or is there anything that can be spoiled? No, I I have had some stuff get spoiled. Like things that they were setting up for future movies. Appearances by other Universal Monsters characters that showed up on there. You know, them being a little too big for their britches. Do you have, uh, like, a second-run theater there by you? You know, I don't know if they have any here. I was just looking for that today, and I was pretty sad in my uh, inability to find one. I may have to 
meet a person and like talk to them so that I can find out if such a thing exists. Because uh, from what I can tell from my internet searches, there isn't any of those. And that really upsets me because my family has a spotty record at seeing films this summer. Half of us saw Guardians of the Galaxy, the other half did not, but they all want to. I think I'm the only one that saw Wonder Woman, but they all want to. And I am now the only one who's seen Spider-Man, and I know they all want to. They're, they're old enough that I should just say, oh, we'll just wait till it hits the dollar, and then we can see it for cheap. But there isn't one! I don't want to have to wait until DVD, although it seems like... Was it Guardians of the Galaxy that was going to be on DVD soon? Yeah, like the second week of August. <laughs> the window has gotten even smaller. And I guess the thing is, anybody who wanted to see Guardians has seen Guardians by now. Same right. thing with Wonder Woman. Of course the theater was empty, like you said. Most people have seen Wonder Woman two or three or four times, which is probably fodder for a whole other episode where I got to ask, Why? But you waiting two weeks to see Spider-Man, how full was it? Uh, it was almost empty. I mean, I saw it the last show of the night on Sunday. So most people aren't going to be going to that. There was, I think, one person. You know how they, they do the reserved seating and you have to pick a seat? Yeah. So, yeah, it, there was one seat that had been bought by the time that I bought mine. You know, a, a few more people came after that. I think there was probably 10 people, maybe, in the theater when the movie started. And there were 20 minutes of trailers. <laughs> that's all we got. But, th I mean, that, that's weeks. Uh, you were saying that Spider-Man has had unsuccess. Is that box office unsuccess? Well, it opened really, really big. The second biggest Spider-Man opening, uh, Spider-Man 3 still has the record. Uh, but then it dropped off really greatly in its second weekend, and people were comparing it to Wonder Woman, and how Wonder Woman had such great legs. She does, yeah. And ass. She does. Sorry. The... <laughs> but, Spider-Man, because of how much I liked it, I assumed there would be great word of mouth, and it wouldn't drop off. But I guess, you know, you've got big releases every week and it's summer and your window is so small but i it's the sixth movie it's the third actor playing that part and it, yeah it follows a terrible film and a mediocre what two films before that i don't know so it just to me it seemed like it did just fine yeah and uh i think you'll find as we have with other movies that the next movie in the uh saga will uh, open much larger and do much better than this one did and hopefully it will be good and we'll be able to hold uh that for the for the future but yeah that that, that might be part of the problem i guess is the um amount of reboots that spider-man has had Oh, one last thing that I did want to mention. Okay. So we did mention Happy, and we mentioned Tony, and we mentioned Pepper. Um, we didn't mention all the goofy little things of Captain America uh, being shown. So you got detention. <laughs> it's something wrong, and now you've got to pay for it. All of his little PSAs that he did. The one part where they're like, I think this guy's a war criminal, but I'm still required <laughs> by the state to uh, show his. <laughs> and then you wait through the whole credits and the very last thing, <laughs> Captain America comes out and uh, starts talking about the importance of patience and waiting till the end. And it pays off, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you feel like you wasted your time. <laughs> and then he goes... How many more of these do we have? Uh, it was funny because after that, <laughs> I was walking out behind these other people that were in the theater with me. And one of them was like, oh, man, I feel like I just got played. <laughs> I was sure they were going to show us something cool like 
like a venom or something, but no, I just got played, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes me like it all the more. Because, yeah. yes, that's almost exactly what it was intended to be. Yep. You know, he comes out, <laughs> it's it's the equivalent of Ferris Bueller coming out and saying, it's over, go home, what, you know. What are you still doing here? Yeah. I mean, plus you got uh, that cool scene in the jail, the mid credit sequence with uh, Tombs not... Not being dead and being set up as, you know, still being around, which is neat. Yeah, what did you gather from that scene? Is Toombs saying, hey, Spider-Man turned out to be an upstanding dude and I ain't gonna get him screwed? Or maybe I'm coming back to get him later? I mean, uh, Spider-Man did save his life when he didn't have to or probably shouldn't have. And maybe that made an impact on him. But you could also interpret it of just, you know, I want Spider-Man. I'm not going to let this goon, I'm not going to let this prong go after Spider-Man. He's like, I have an advantage over every all of his enemies. And, you know, I'm going to play that card when the time is right. Uh, he could also end up, you know, Getting a bunch of guys together to go after Spider-Man and and uh, Ryan, uh, not Rhino, uh, Scorpion will be one of them. I don't know. Maybe like seven guys or six. So if you were doing the sequel, who would you have Spider-Man fight in the next one? I don't know. Craven the Hunter. <laughs> well, we haven't seen Craven, right? Uh, we've seen so many Spider-Man movies that we've nearly seen them all. I don't know. Uh, Craven is cool because he's different than uh, other bad guys where they just they want this or that. Craven is like a little crazy and he just he wants to hunt things. He doesn't have some kind of ulterior motive like he's trying to make a bunch of money or something. He's he's basically the dude from the most dangerous game short story. Somebody who has I don't know if it has to be somebody who hasn't been done. I mean, I like the, a lot of the guys that they've already done, but I suppose you probably don't. Especially with this movie, they go out of their way to do guys that haven't been done. Or things that haven't been done anyways, you know? They, um, they're trying to do it their own way, so Craven would be good. You've got Scorpion. Well, yeah, a lot of people are excited. You know, it's like, oh, hey, we're going to have Venom again. I don't think that's such a good idea. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Venom would be cool. Uh, maybe Venom and Carnage. <sighs> I mean, Green Goblin and uh, Dr. Octopus are both very cool, but they were also done. So I don't know. should go for it. Who would you have be the one that you'd choose? Well, I don't know. It's, like you said, you want to do something that's different visually different in power and all that, you know, they had absorbing man on agents of shield and he's a really cool visual villain. There's like hydro man, you know, the guy whose body can become water. He's visually really interesting. Also visually interesting black cat. Hmm. Yes. Very interesting. <laughs> those visuals. I, it, it would be neat to see, them try and do that, especially with this geeky, dorky, teenage Spider-Man, where it's just like, holy cow. And she doesn't know he's a kid. Um, I don't know how you could pull that off. You would take somebody with really cast iron nuts to do Black Cat, <laughs> right? Uh, Spider-Man has just great rogues gallery. I, I, I love a huge number of Spider-Man's villains. Uh, but there's nothing saying you couldn't bring back the Shocker and give the Scorpion his outfit. Um, it would be neat to see, like, the Smythes with their Spider Slayer machines, to see Jameson again. Doc Ock would be great, but he's been done so well. I don't right. know how you could do it better. Whereas, I, you know, I, I, I never liked the way that the Goblin looked in that first Spider-Man movie. I think you could do him better, but I don't know that they will. I mean, how many goblins have we had? Three? 
in these movies, and have that, we had that three? Too many. Well, Harry became something like a goblin <laughs> in Amazing Spider-Man Two. Yeah, and... I guess that's true. But yeah, I'd like to see Craven. I'm I'm placing my vote there. Okay, that sounds. I don't good. know that anybody cares, but I am. I I agree with you then. <laughs> I'm there opening day to see him fight Craven. All right. Well, I'll be there in week two to see him fight Craven. Yeah. <laughs> it's on Sunday night, the last showing where nobody's there. I don't know if that's going to always be the way of things, but hard to find time. <laughs> I guess it's just getting all this stuff set up and emptying out all these stupid boxes. <sighs> It'll be nice when we've got, we, we, I would say we're 70% of the way there. No, probably not. Probably more like 50. Uh, our garage is just full of stuff where we're just like, I don't know where to put it. And so we just put it in the garage. We don't have a basement anymore. So all that crap that we just kept in the basement has to go somewhere. Our cars can't go in the garage because of all the garbage. But um, eventually I'll have free time. Well, yeah, I hope so. I hope things go back to normal and you're in a routine and you can predict how things are going to be just so you can start living your life again. Yeah. And little things need to stop happening. Like this morning I had to go get my windshield wipers fixed because a torrential downpour opened up on us on Saturday and then all of a sudden my windshield wipers stopped working properly they got tangled together and almost broke off. And it's really hard to drive a car if you don't have windshield wipers. So I made sure to immediately get right out to the mechanic to get that fixed. Luckily, it turned out to be no big deal. For once. Yeah. I need that, those things to stop as well. Because then I can't even do the things that I need to do in the first place. And there's a lot of those. But yeah, what movie uh, is next in the pipe? Dunkirk? <laughs> you know, I'd like to see Dunkirk, yeah. Be, it's one of those where I feel like I owe Christopher Nolan my loyalty, you know? Yeah. He'd have to make two or three ladies in the water for me to say, okay, I'm not going to go see Christopher Nolan movies anymore. But right now, yeah. Yeah, see, I haven't, I haven't found the marketing campaign for Dunkirk to be very good. I don't know if they expect everybody to know about Dunkirk and what has happened there. It's all just like, there's a lot of tension and people are getting blown up. Come and see it. <laughs> uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it's got like a score in the 90s. Uh, 98, Wow, it looks like. So that's... Beyond just in the 90s. <laughs> but um, it seems like it's going to be too depressing to watch. By the time you're, you're done, you're going to feel like you were actually in the war. And you're going to be like, wow, I'll never talk about this to my children. Because it was too harrowing. Yeah, I guess the next thing that we're really going to be interested in isn't until Thor, right? Yeah, there's Thor and then you know, there's we... Star Wars. I know there's another animated Disney movie coming out, but uh, I can't even remember what it's called. You know, we could do one on Cars 3. I saw that. Oh, you did? Is it one I need to go out and see? <laughs> oh, rush right out. No, it was a Cars movie. It was, I'd give it like a 67%. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait. No, that's what uh, Rotten Tomatoes gave it. What did Cars 2 have? Cars 2 had a 39. Mm. So this one is a much improved. Of course, Cars 1 only got a 74. It uh, has never been a highly rated series, despite the fact that they keep making more of them. Well, it sells a ton of merchandise, and that's why they keep making them. It's an obvious place to go, is making car toys. It's super easy. No imagination necessary. Well, all right. I think we've run our course in this show. We're probably past our course in this show. We probably should have ended about 15 minutes ago. That's all right. We can cut out <laughs> all of this. 
All right, well, I'm going to say thanks for listening to everybody and say that I'm Big Anklevich. What? And I'm Rich Outfield. Thank you for uh, getting together with me, even if it was virtually. No problem. I love a little virtual hangout. Should I see you, folks? Okay, well, uh, do whatever a spider can, okay? All right. Like, spin a web? Any size? <laughs> Is he strong? Listen, bud. <laughs> I love the words to that song. I do, too. Just the fact that they'd say, listen, bud, he's got radioactive blood. You almost expect, like, the next line to have motherfucker in it, you know? (laughs) Listen, bud, don't you sass me. All right, good night, man. Good night. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license for some reason. I think I'm gonna watch Valerian, the city of, the city of what? City of a thousand planets. Planets. Wait, why would you do that? I think I'm gonna force you to watch it too, so that we can do a show just about Valerian. <laughs> it looks cartoony. It makes me think of the Fifth Element from back in the '90s, which was done by the same dude, right? That's right. Luc Besson. Ew. Is that how you say it? I don't know. That's what I assume, but I'm I'm not his friend. (laughs) I think it would be fun to force you to go to that just because you are so against going to that. Well, to me, it looks awful. Just super campy, but not in a inept sort of way, but like in a, we intentionally did it this way sort of way. Like, kind of like Ruby Rod in Fifth Element. (laughs) <laughs> they did not accidentally make Chris Tucker act that way, you know. It that was all intentional, and and I, you know, I expect it to be a disaster. I expect nobody to go to it, but yes, I do have a morbid curiosity about it. 